Greetings and welcome back. We now find ourselves uh, again in uh, Macbeth 1, 3, Act 1, Scene 3 is where we will be uh, now. Uh, and we will, uh, we will make the quick observation for your notes, write this down right away, that Act 1, Scene 3 will be where we meet Macbeth for the first time. But we don't meet him right away in 1, 3. Rather, we come back to the witches. When did we see the witches last? 1-1. One, one. One, one, where they were chanting, fair is foul and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filthy air. However, these witches early on had to ask, when shall we three meet again in thunder, lightning, or in rain, when the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost, or won? You, you didn't catch me. I was and won. There. Well done, Mr. Keeley. When the battle's lost and won. Right. Well done, Mr. Keeley. I was testing your memory ability. Outstanding. There to meet Macbeth. So now we're taking 1-3 and we're joining it uh, uh, to 1-1. One, one, and now the three witches are there. They are going to go through a little kind of observation about where they've been and what they've been doing to show that they've been doing nasties, as witches will do. And then Macbeth will come onto the stage. Uh, we're going to listen to this, but I want you to put a note in your, in your annotations to this effect. Always interesting to look at the very first words spoken by the major actor of a Shakespeare play, major character. So, for example, if I were to ask you, I don't predict that you can do it, but if I were to ask you, what is the very first lines Romeo speaks? As seniors, if you were to go back and look at those very first lines of Romeo, and some of you will Google this just to see it, you will say, oh, whoa, there's all kinds of importance now that I know that play. There's all kinds of importance in the very first thing he says. That's true for the very first lines that Lear speaks, the very first lines that Othello speaks, the very first lines that Hamlet will speak, and that famous aside, a little more than kin and less than kind, and on and on we could go. So the very first words that Macbeth speaks, anyone want to scan to see what they are? What are the very first words that he speaks? How foul and fair a day I have not seen. Whoa, whoa, whoa. What's interesting about that? I mean, right away, what's interesting about that? If you've been paying even kind of attention to this play, you know what? Who's the ones that have spoken those words? The witches. You got it, the witches. Which seems to suggest already they're casting their spell, putting their net out onto the waters to catch poor Macbeth. What does it mean to say so foul and fair a day I have not seen? By the way, when he comes on stage, he's covered in blood and guts. Why? Why is he covered in blood? He's coming back from the battle. He's got blood on his face. He's got blood on his hands. This is a play for your notes. This is a play of blood. We're going to see it over and over again, a play of blood. It is a play of butchery. It is a play of killing. It's a play of slaughter. And Macbeth has been slaughtering. Why, why foul? Do you have any sense of it? It's bad weather. Write it down. Bad weather. Now, in Shakespeare's day, no kidding, you got up in the morning, and if the weather looked bad, you literally went back inside your house a lot of times. I am not kidding. These people were hyper superstitious. They, they oftentimes equated bad weather with bad stuff about to happen. I ain't fooling you. And so, for example, if it was thunder and lightning outside, they often would not go outside of their house. They would stay indoors for the entire day out of fear something terrible was happening. Weather is in this play going to correlate with bad things happening, no, no doubt. So is night. Night is also going to be very often associated, and certainly in this play, we've already seen this, haven't we? When one, we open the play in the middle of the night. The, 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 um, also, there's going to be a lot of fog in 1-3, which will, of course, immediately think, make us return to that hover through the fog and filthy air line of 1-1. Why is it a fair day? He won. Hurrah, I'm the winner. He's alive. Wait a minute. When he comes on stage, he ain't alone, though. He's with his best pal, Banquo. Now, Banquo will serve as his foil or his alter ego, as it's often referred to, as his other. Banquo is a significantly important person in the play, even though he doesn't get a lot of prime time in the play, for reasons I'm going to save and talk about later, all right, when we get to it. Banquo, for your notes now, 
is Macbeth's best friend. That's important because when Macbeth is hailed by the three witches, I'm setting you up and then we'll listen. He's hailed, first of all, as the title he currently has, Thane of Glamis. Then he is hailed, secondly, as the title he's about to be given, but he doesn't know this yet, Thane of Caldor. Then third, the witches will hail him as king hereafter. Whoa. That's good news, by the way. That's like, be, that's like uh, going to the uh, fair and, you know, that fortune teller lady, and she says, tomorrow you're going to win $10 million in a free lottery. They give away the money. But Macbeth, instead of going, yay, I get to be king someday, like, what the he does go, but he doesn't say anything. Look at what Banquio says immediately after the three witches hail Macbeth as king hereafter, what does what, what, what his pal Banquio say about him? Now, it's interesting because best friends know things. They pick up on things that other people wouldn't pick up on. Banquio points out, why do you start? Like, it's almost like somebody's read his mind and seemed to fear things that are so fair, that are good. Right? That is to say, why are you... Why? And then Banquia wants to play the game, like he's at the fair and the fortune teller's there. Hey, 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 tell me, tell me what my future will be. Mac, uh, Banquio will be given his famous three prophecies. This is a play, you can write it down, this is a play of threes. And these prophecies will come, first early and then later. These three prophecies will come. Here, Banquio's going to get a, a three prophecies. And again, I want you to point out for your notes, and then you'll hear it, paradox. Paradox. It's not going to make sense. For example, one of the three prophecies to Banquio is that you're not going to be as happy as Macbeth. You're just going to be happier. Yeah, and Chris just kind of went like this. What? Like that. And that's exactly how Banquio does it on stage. Like, what? Then all of a sudden, guess who comes on stage? Ross. What we say about Ross? He's the messenger, isn't he? He comes onto the stage and he goes, hey, hey, I got great news. Uh, Macbeth, you get to be Thane of Cowder. The king is named you Thane of Cowder. Pay attention to who speaks as soon as he has been named Thane of Cowder. Is it Macbeth or is it Banquio? Okay. And then right away, Macbeth starts to have strange things in his mind, strange thoughts in his mind. Of course, the easiest way for us to say it today is two down, one to go. Isn't that the way we say it? Wait a minute, what's the two down? Well, he's already Thane of Gloms and he's just been named Thane of Kaldor. What's left? Right? So all of a sudden, we're going to get the two down, one to go thought, which suggests something's up with Macbeth in his mind. He will step off to the side for a little bit and he'll kind of speak out loud so the audience can understand but nobody else on stage pretends like they can hear it. What do we call that again? Soliloquy. It's an aside, not a soliloquy. Remember, a soliloquy and an aside are similar, but soliloquy, one character alone. And Macbeth's not alone. He's got other people on stage with him. But it's definitely an aside where we're going to hear Macbeth's been thinking about wanting to be king. There's only one problem. You don't vote kings in from Monty Python, right? I didn't vote for you. You don't vote for a king. See, that's the, that's the joke uh, of Monty Python's Holy Grail. You don't vote for kings. How do you become a king? You have to be what? You have to be the son of a king, don't you? Right? You have to be the son of a king. Well, Duncan already has two sons. Malcolm and Donald Bain, we've already met one, haven't we? In one, two, right? That is to say, Macbeth can only be king by doing nasties. That's the only way he's going to get to be king. All right, let's listen now to one, three. Pay close attention. Hey, in kindergarten, you could hear the teacher read the story to you, and you could sit and enjoy it. We're not in kindergarten anymore. So instead of just sitting and listening to this reading, and trust me, you're going to understand what's going on. Read the words yourself so that you're beginning to learn how to read Shakespeare. That way, here, in the next couple of days, when you pick up Hamlet and begin to read Hamlet on your own, you'll be able to read it on your own with some understanding. Let's take a look now. All right, here we go. One, three. Nasty witches. Uh -huh. Chestnuts in her lap, and mouth, 
and mouth, and mouth. Give me a point be which the rough Federonian cries. Her husband's to a leco gone, master the tiger. But in a sail, I did a sail, unlike a rat without a tail. I'll do, <laughs> I'll do, and I'll do. So, to the self same tune and words. Who's here? The king has happily received Macbeth the news of thy success. And when he reads thy personal venture in the rebel's fight, his wonders and his praises do contend, which should be thine or his. Silence with that. 
like viewing all the rest of the self same day, he finds thee in the stout Norway and ranks nothing afeard of what thyself didst make strange images of death. As thick as hail came post to post, and every one did bear thy praises in his kingdom's great defense and poured them down. We are sent to give thee from our royal master thanks, only to herald thee into his sight, not pay thee. And for an earnest of a great honor, he bade me from him call thee Thane of Cordor. In which addition, hail, most worthy thing, for it is thine. What? Can the devil speak true? So you say? The thane of Cordor lives. Why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Who was the thane lives yet, but under heavy judgment bears that life which he deserves to lose. Whether he was combined with those of Norway, or did line the rebel with hidden help and vantage, or that with both he labored in his country's rack, I know not. But treason's capital confessed and proved have overthrown him. Alarms and fain of Cordor. The greatest is behind. Here it is. Thanks for your pains. Do you not hope your children shall be kings when those that gave the fane of Cordor to me promised no less to them? That trusted have <coughs> my gift and kindled you one to the crown besides the fane of Cordor. And this train. And oftentimes, to win us to our harm, the instruments of darkness tell us truth, win us with honest trifles to betray us in deepest consequence. Guns, a word I pray you. Too true thou told, as have they prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme. I thank you, gentlemen. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. If ill, why has it given me earnest of success convincing the truth? I'm fain of Cordor. If good, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth fix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, whose murder yet is but fantastical, Shakes all my simple state of man that function is smothered in surmise, and nothing is but what is not. Look how our partner's wrapped. If chance will have me king, why, chance may crown me without my stir. You others come upon him like our strange garments, cleave not to their mold, but with the aid of youth. Come what come may, time and the hour runs through the roughest day. Well, in Macbeth! We stay upon your leisure. Give me your favor. My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered for every day. I turn the leaf to read them. Let us toward the king. Think about what has chanced. And at more time, the interim having waited, let us speak our free hearts each to other. Very glad to learn. Enough. Come, friends. the really interesting <clears throat> things to always point out in the study of Shakespeare is the way in which he will blend or weave ideas, themes. So one of the things I want to point out is the way in which in this play there are certain kinds of, I'm going to use a word now, motifs or themes. One of the most popular that has often been referenced in the study of the play Macbeth is what we will call the garment theme. The garment theme. All the way through this play, clothes matter. The way you're garbed, the way you're dressed, your garment. And in this very scene, we will in fact right away be introduced to this. Notice that when Macbeth is named Thane of Cawdor by who? The messenger character, Ross. The first thing he says is, why do you address me in borrowed robes? Then a little bit later, Banquio will point out, look how our partner is wrapped. It's as if he's taken his garment and wrapped it around him. We will point out this theme all the way through this play, the notion of you are what you wear or your garments. Sometimes they fit. Sometimes they don't fit. Let's exegete now quickly 
um, the, these lines uh, um, <clears throat> to, um, to make sure we're okay with, with what exactly it is that Macbeth says when he's in these asides. Notice, though, Banquio's three prophecies. Jot those down real quickly. They, they uh, come for you on page 347, line 65. The first which will prophesy that Banquio will be, again, 347, line 65. Lesser than Macbeth, but greater. You're not going to be as great as Macbeth. You're just going to be greater than Macbeth. What? See, paradox. Look at the next one. Not so happy, this is the one we mentioned before, yet must ha much happier. And then finally, look at this one. Thou shalt get kings. What does that mean? Your sons will be kings, though thou be none. Right. You're never going to be a king, but your sons will get to be king. Which is, of course, very problematic because, as we've already pointed out, your daddy has to be a king if you're a son and you want to be a king. And yet there the prophecies are. Notice that it will now um, fall on uh, Banquo to make the observation to Macbeth, we got to be careful what we think about these witches. Notice that Banquo will point out that uh, this, is, this is kind of dangerous. Look on page 348. Macbeth will say, your children shall be kings. He's playing the game already of the prophecies. Look at Banquo. You shall be king, right? Notice Macbeth says, and Thane of Cowder too, were it not so. To the self-same tune and words, who's there? Ross comes on and he says, hey, you're Thane of Cowder. It will be Macbeth who's remained silent. It will be Banquo who says, what? Can the devil speak true? What does that mean, the devil? The witches, you got it. They're known to be evil, foul, and yet they've given a good message, fair, it's true, right? He that, uh, uh, the thing of Cowder lives, Macbeth says, why do you dress me in borrowed robes? Well, Angus will say, yeah, he lives, but not for long. We're going we're gonna to jack him good. The very first aside, top of page 349, Glams and Thane of Cardor, the greatest is behind, which tells the audience what? Two down, one to go. Two down, one to go. Let's point this out right away. Macbeth is the protagonist hero of our play. He's not very, not very heroic, though. But to follow the way Aristotle thought about great drama, he will begin a high and noble man, a great and mighty warrior. But by the end of the play, some of Shakespeare's groundlings are tossing eggs at him as he is coming onto the stage. He is so loathed. He's one of the worst of Shakespeare's villains. He begins high and he ends low. He ends pretty ruined and in a wretched state. Notice it will be Banquio that will give the caution at line 121. You better be careful because sometimes, he says, the instruments of darkness tell us truths, line 125, win us with honest trifles to betray us the deepest consequence. In other words, what does that mean? Sometimes witches will tell you the truth just so they can get you even worse later. Macbeth's Next aside will tell us just how dark his thoughts are. Two truths are told as happy prologues to the swelling act of the imperial theme, imperial ear, royal, kingly. And then he'll say, I thank you, gentlemen, for your news. And then he comes back to it. Look at how confused he is. Hover through the fog and filthy air. Right? He's not sure. Is this a good thing? Is this a bad thing? Take a look at it. This supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, bad, cannot be good. Which is it? Is it good news or bad news? If ill, that is bad. Why hath it given me earnest of success commencing in a truth? Can't be totally bad. I mean, look, it was true. I am Thane of Caldor. If good, in other words, if it's a good thing, why do I yield to that suggestion whose horrid image doth unfix my hair and make my seated heart knock at my ribs against the use of nature? He asks, if it's a good thing, why am I thinking such terrible thoughts right now that would make my hair stand up? He says, I'm thinking such horrific things. What do you imagine he's thinking about? 
Yeah, how he's going to jack the king, right, to get to the throne. Present fears are less than horrible imaginings. My thought, and then he uses the word for the very first time, whose murder yet is but fantastical. He's only thought about murdering. Shakes so my single state of man, the function is smothered in surmise, and nothing is but what is not in a line. I'm confused. I don't know whether to be happy or sad about the way I feel right now about this dynamic. He's used the word murder already, and important for a second theme of our play, along with the garment theme, there is the theme of manhood. This one you want to write down. Bless you. You want to write this one down right away. The question is simple. What constitutes a good man? And in this play, we're going to meet that question over and over again. Pancreo will say, look at our partner's rap. That is to say, he's kind of distracted. Look, look at what Macbeth says next in another aside. If chance shall have me king, why chance may count me? K sera sera. Whatever will be, will be. If I'm going to be king, I guess I'll get to be king. If I'm not going to be king, I guess that's just the way it works out. How long do you think he'll have that K sera sera view? Well, not long, right, not long. So he's going to have this tension, let's say it this way for your notes. There's like this psychological tension. I should tell you, I don't do a lot of this in terms of my own biography, but I actually don't come out of the humanities and my academic training originally. My original training was actually in the field of psychology, and it was there that I was actually first introduced seriously to many of these tragedies of Shakespeare, especially this play, and I think I know why. When you are studying the psychology of individuals, that is to say what goes on in their mind, Shakespeare is the greatest writer to try and crawl inside of the human mind and begin to think, uh, show us how, how the mind works, how the brain works, how the, the, the psychology works. Here already we're watching, we're watching a man's mind begin to be broken down so that he'll hear a promise, you'll get to be a king. Then... He gets the prophecy fulfilled of Thane of Kaldor. Then he begins to already start to think about, what do I got to do to become king? What do I got to do to... Oh, I'm not going to think about it. I'm not going to think about it. I'm just going to let chance crown me king if chance will have me king. Yeah, we kind of get the idea. That, I, that attitude isn't going to last for long. We will finish 1-3 by Macbeth saying at the very bottom of 349, and by the way, this is why we read and don't just watch this play. Look at what he says. Give me your favor. My dull brain, that's because he's called back. He's been standing off to the side. And they've been talking for a few seconds. And Macbeth is kind of like almost lost in thought. It's almost like he doesn't even realize those guys are there. Look what he says. My dull brain was wrought with things forgotten. What does that tell you? I forgot about he forgot about what? He forgot about oh, wanting to be king. Right. It's fairly clear that this is a play, first and foremost, about power, about ambition. Uh, there was an old-time preacher I heard once as a kid. He had a famous sermon, and it went like this. He got what he wanted, but he lost what he had. He got what he wanted, but he lost what he had. Mr. Nelson, the story of David and Bathsheba, a very popular story from the Old Testament, was his proof text here. But it works perfectly for Macbeth. He gets what he wants, power, because he has ambition. But he loses what he had, namely respect, honor. And he says here, I've been thinking about this thing about wanting to be a king, and now all of a sudden it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. The witches remind him. Put it in your notes. We will come to this question over and over again, and that's why I'm raising it now in 1-3. Who is to blame for all of the terrible things that happen in this play? Let's say it out loud, Mr. Durant. Macbeth becomes a pathological killer. This is a play about a mass murderer, a pathological murderer, <clears throat> an individual who murders and doesn't even think twice about it. Okay? The question will obviously be, who is to blame for this? Who do you blame for this kind of thing? And, of course, the answers are going to be mixed. One obvious answer already is Macbeth has clearly already been thinking about it. He says as much. I had forgotten that I had been musing about what it would mean to be a king. Of course, we could also already blame the witches, right, who we've met. 
ultimately we may meet one or two other characters as well who will come to play import, important influence. Kind gentlemen, your pains are registered where every day I turn the leaf to read them, let us toward the king, and then an aside to Banquio, think upon what hath, look at the word he uses, chanced. Oh, what a lucky chance. The whole notion of luck. And at more time, the interim having weighed, let us speak our free hearts to each other. Macbeth says, I'm very interested in what you have to think about what has just transpired. Leaving the audience to understand that Macbeth is already thinking about what it would take to get the throne, to become the king. And of course, we're going to watch a man who will pursue that ambition for power with nasty, nasty actions. Okay, and, and yet, we're going to walk away from it for a few moments as we get ready to begin uh, scene four. We'll pick up with one four tomorrow. Thank you.